Thank you, Amanda. Well, it's the 10th of October, and as we've said, we're in the most locked down city in the world, but we have been traveling with the Apostle Paul. And today we've reached Athens. And uh, as I said, a couple of years ago, Christian and I were able to visit Athens and uh, actually climbed up uh, to the Acropolis and looked at the Parthenon, the temple of, to Athena, the goddess of Athens, after whom the city is named. It's a, you don't have to scale the, the walls of the Acropolis. There's a pathway up, a very busy pathway, I have to say, back then. And from up on that height, you could look down on this rock, which is called, uh, it's known as Mars Hill from the King James translation of the Bible, but it's uh, more properly named uh, the Areopagus, where the wise men of the town conducted their debates and, uh, and uh, discussed affairs of civic importance. So I've used this image as a, as a kind of icon for our theme today, uh, Paul's address at the Areopagus. And uh, one of the things I discovered as I, as I went to climb up, uh, uh, at the bottom there's a huge bra bronze plaque and it has the entire text that Amanda read to us in Greek the original language of the New Testament, uh, so that we have Paul's address there for all who can read Greek. I didn't linger to struggle over it, but uh, there it is. And we need to ask ourselves, of course, we, what the address amounts to is a two-minute sort of summary, really, of the address, so that what Luke has given us is a sort of a digest that can be reduced to the salient features of the address and one can imagine that there are very likely be exchanges on the way through. Uh, but I want to pick up on five things, as uh, hopefully not too much to, to burden you with, but uh, just to uh, observe certain things that have been mentioned. I want to mention the deep distress of the Apostle Paul. I want to mention the Epicurean and Stoic views, uh, because these words don't exactly mean what we think of today. I want to think about playwrights and poets. I want to think about an appointment with the Creator. And I want to think about two people whose names are mentioned, Dionysius, uh, whom I'm just calling Dion for the heck of it, and Damaris. So here are two people who are mentioned at the end of the story. So let's just think about, firstly, the distress that the Apostle Paul felt. What was this deep distress? Well. This was not his usual approach uh, to go to uh, the civic center and debate with the scholars and uh, important uh, people of the town. His usual method was to go to the synagogue. And in fact, that's what he did do in Athens as well, although you could easily overlook that because it's just mentioned at the beginning that he went to the synagogue as his custom was. Uh, because there he knew he had people who had uh, the bulk of this book accessible to them. They had the scrolls of the Torah, the Old Testament writings. Uh, those, those writings had already been translated into Greek about 200 years before Jesus came. Because when Alexander spread through this part of the world, uh, he made Greek the universal language. And so the Jewish elders decided, well, their Hebrew scrolls had to be translated into Greek. So the, the Greek world knew the Jewish scriptures because it was seeded with synagogues in the providence of God. They were there and they were connected by Roman roads. And the Apostle Paul has come down, uh, possibly down the coast by boat, we're not sure, but it seems that he came by, by sea down to Athens. And, uh, and there he was in the synagogue discussing the meaning of the Hebrew scriptures. But there was something that troubled him about Athens. And that was the, the fact that there were altars everywhere. One of the words used describes it as a forest of altars. There were so many in some parts of the city. And this distressed him deeply that, uh, that uh, he, he felt uh, the, the, uh, the ignorance, really. And then he came across an altar which was to an unknown God. And, and that perhaps triggered him because his talk begins and ends with what they didn't know. It's an interesting feature of his, his presentation. But they heard him uh, in the public square and the marketplace, the Agora, and he was talking about Jesus and the resurrection. And these are the themes that we've 
been hearing from him again and again as he's journeyed. Uh, particularly in, in, in this uh, second missionary trip, we've heard of him in Philippi, we've heard of him in Thessalonica. We didn't linger in Berea, just a bit further up the coast, uh, because he spent a very brief time there and was chased away from there by the Thessalonians. But the Bereans actually took to what he said really well, and they searched the scriptures and found what he was saying and uh, was, was uh, believable, and uh, they entered into the faith. But now he's in a totally different environment, and they don't know uh, Jesus and the resurrection. And uh, one scholar says that he, uh, it seems that when he was speaking in the public square uh, about Jesus and the resurrection, they took the word, the Greek word for resurrection, which is Anastasos, uh, and they, they assumed that this was Anastasia, the consort of, the, of a god named Jesus. So he was a thinking, here's a pair of gods that we haven't heard about. And they invite him to the Areopagus to talk about these things because it was common to hear things debated, new ideas. They were open to discussion and learning. It was a feature of, uh, of the uh, Greek uh, philosophy. So the words of the unknown God seem to have come down from the time of uh, Socrates, actually, which is early in the fourth century, around 390 to 380 BC, and was roughly a mile north of where they were on this particular day. And that was the place where they asked questions like, do the gods really exist? You know, are they up there on Mount Olympus? Who knows? Who goes there? What do we think about the gods? And there, was, there were answers to these questions. And the, uh, the unknown god inscription, Paul generously assumes uh, to mean that there is a question here that they don't know. They're agnostic. The word agnostic means to not know. And so they're open to something, he hopes, that, that he has to share. There are two types of agnosticism. Uh, there is the kind of agnosticism that's kind of inconsistent and says, I don't know, but I know you can't know. And there's the kind of agnosticism that says, I don't know, but I'm open to what you may say. And that's what the Apostle Paul is assuming, that they're consistently agnostic. There's an, an altar that says to the unknown God, and it's distressed him, and uh, he, he uh, wants to share about it with them. The, the gods, of course, of the city, there were 12 famous gods, most famously represented in the uh, marbles at the marble statues in the Parthenon. Here are the names of those 12 gods. Uh, they all not only had Greek names but Roman names. Some of them have made it into Western uh, tradition and culture. We've uh, no doubt heard about uh, Poseidon, uh, Zeus, Apollos, whom I'll mention later on. Artemis was uh, famous in Ephesus, as we shall discover, or we did, did discover when we were in Ephesus, and, uh, and so on. So here, Ares, the god of war. So these are some of the, the gods that the Greeks had. And, and so was there another unknown God? And the Apostle Paul says, yes, I want to tell you about it. But before we go to his very Jewish answer, I want to pick up the idea of Epicurean and Stoics. Now, uh, if you're like me, you tend to think when you think of Epicurean of that page in the newspaper, which deals with fine dining and uh, you know, gourmet recipes, uh, the good things in life. And, and if you think of stoic, you think of uh, some stiff upper lip, enduring difficulty uh, without complaining. So we've got these ideas in the, in the Western culture nowadays. But uh, I, I was looking uh, closely uh, at one of the commentaries and it said this, that the, the Epicurean idea was that the gods were remote and uninterested really in human life. And the best idea uh, as, as uh, human beings, the best way we can get a, a life, the ideal life, it's attained by moderation and not arousing the gods, just having the right amount of everything. So uh, they don't want really what we offer on our altars. And that part of Paul's speech fits in with that idea. But contrary to that idea, he does say, that the God he's going to tell them about isn't very far away, a lot closer than they think. 
So that's the, the Epicurean response. God is uh, remote, uh, uh, uninterested, and that the ideal life is attained by living moderately and not arousing the gods. Uh, but, says Paul, he's closer than you think. And the Stoic uh, view was pantheist. That is, that there's a bit of God in everything and everyone. We've all got a bit of God in us. Uh, and so very close. Uh, but Paul is different. He's, he has an idea that God is distinct from the creation. However, there are points of connection in his speech with, uh, with Stoic ideas. For example, he says that he gives life and breath to us. And what could be closer than our, our life and our breath? Uh, and, he, and he quotes uh, one of the Athenian poets, uh, Aratus, who had written that we are all his children. And there is a sense in which we are all his created children. God has made us and we are, belong to him. And, and he says this creator invites us to know him. So here is, in a sense, the the way in which Paul's message reaches into the various ways of thinking of the people who are gathered there with him. And I want to say here that what we're thinking about is playwrights and poets. We're thinking about Paul's unchanging theme, Jesus and the resurrection, but his presentation is so different, so very different from what happened in the synagogue where, where they opened the scriptures and, and read them and thought about them which is the way Protestant services usually begin, by reading the scripture and thinking about them. But we live in a world where a lot of people don't open the scripture, don't know the scripture. And in, in this world, on the Areopagus, they had no scriptures. And so he began with their culture. He began with their playwrights and their poets. And I think there's an important lesson for us here too, that, that in depending on who we're with, we need to begin where we are. Before I did engineering, before I did uh, theology, I did engineering, and uh, I did civil engineering. And uh, to my great surprise, I've discovered uh, an Anglican bishop and about a half a dozen ministers who all went from civil engineering into Christian ministry. And I always put it down to the idea that civil engineering delights in bridges. You want to build a bridge across a gap. And what we see in, in uh, the Christian scriptures is the way God has bridged the gap between himself and humanity, and it's in a person. And when we speak to people and we want to bridge the gap, we may begin with the scriptures, uh, but we may also begin with, with the people we're with and ask why they think the way they do and how did they get to this or that idea and, and if you can build from both ends, you see. And sometimes it's very important to do both. If you think of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, it had to be built from both ends. You couldn't keep on going more than halfway. Uh, it had to meet in the middle so that the load was carried, was then distributed. And many bridges are like that. They're fairly unstable until they're, they're completed. Think of the Westgate Bridge in Melbourne and the terrible collapse that it had when it was only partially built. So here we have the Apostle Paul, and he's begun with their uh, poets and their, and their uh, playwrights. So we need to open up the culture and make people think, what does, what does our culture say about this? And this is a, an important idea. One of the books I've been introduced recently by a friend whom I had coffee with occasionally, well, regularly on Tuesday if he could make it, he challenged me to read a book called Sapiens by uh, Yuval Noah Harari. Now, this man is a, is a Jewish intellectual who, uh, who has made a name for himself by several books, but he's also an atheist. And so I'm always interested in the ideas of Jews who are atheists because it seems they've rejected their culture. And, and I've read one of his books and I've dipped into an, another one and I've watched his TED talk and several other things by him. And he, he's interesting, but he begins with the assumption that everything just happens, that everything comes from nothing. And uh, there is no God. God is a uh, fiction, like many things that we believe are fictions. 
like money is a, a kind of fiction that we all accept, and even says nations are fiction. And if you think this is a remote idea and far away, I just want to let you know that I discovered this week that his book is available in copy comic strip format for children, and it's being made into a, a video, a comic strip type video. And here he explains these ideas to really embed in the lives of young people the idea that there is no God, it's all just made up, and make up the best story you can. That seems to be the gist of what he says. He actually says, he, he credits the idea of human rights with Christians, but human rights are just a fiction too, he says. So really kind of interesting the way he mixes and matches. So I want to contrast this with one of the ideas that was very formative for me. Back in the late 1960s, I, I read a book by C.S. Lewis, uh, which was a series of uh, addresses which he gave at the, so the Oxford Socratic Society. So we're back to Socrates here. And he, he's a beautiful piece called is, is Theology Poetry? And this is what he says at the end of that, uh, that article. And I have to say, I, I don't memorize much like this, but the, the end of this text, I remembered enough of it to Google it quite easily and find exactly where it was. I still have the book. And he says this, uh, granted that reason is prior to matter. Right? Now that's, that's exactly not what Yuval Noah Harari says. Harari says matter, the, the Big Bang happened and everything happened and then we worked out reason, it evolved. But Lewis is saying, no, if you think if you think everything comes from nothing, then I'm, I'm on a different page. Lewis is saying there's God. He, he can't accept the idea that everything comes from nothing. How do you get something from nothing? Well, he says there is a creator. So reason is prior to matter. This is a Jewish idea, the logos. Uh, wisdom was in the beginning with God. So. Uh, so we get it in Proverbs chapter 8 in the Old Testament. We get it in John chapter 1 in the New. But he's saying this, granted that reason is prior to matter and that the right uh, of the primal, the light of the primal reason illuminates finite minds. I can understand, I can understand how men should come by observation and inference to know a lot about the universe in which they live. If, on the other hand, and this is what I think is important, if, on the other hand, I swallow the scientific cosmology as a whole, then not only can I not fit in Christianity, but I cannot fit in science. If minds are wholly dependent on brains and brains on biochemistry, and biochemistry, uh, in the long run, on the meaningless flux of atoms, I cannot understand how the thought of mo those minds should have any more significance than the sound of the wind in the trees. And this to me is the final test. This is how I distinguish dreaming and waking. When I am awake, I can, in, uh, I, I can in some degree account for and study my dream. The waking world is judged more real because it can contain the dreaming world. The dreaming world is judged less real because it cannot contain the waking world. And then he concludes that uh, whole talk with these words. For the same reason, I am certain that in passing from the scientific point of view to the theological, I have passed from dream to waking. Christian theology can fit in science, art, morality, the sub-Christian religions, he calls them. The scientific point of view cannot fit in any of these things, it, not even science itself. Uh, that's an amazing thing. And I think that's why Harari has to look in other places for the idea of human rights. He, he's committed to everything being just a fiction, something we've dreamed up. So. Here is, here is Lewis, and then he, he concludes by these words, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. So here we are talking about 
poets and playwrights, about the ideas that circulate in our world. And these are ideas which children learn at school and which children will continue to learn at school. Lewis put them in his uh, Narnia tales. And since then, of course, another Oxford professor uh, has uh, written against them from an atheist point of view, uh, written his own book on uh, the golden compass and so on. So that those books are dealing with big ideas and which we are invited to think about, just in much the same way as those men and women on Mars Hill had to think about what Paul was saying and square them off with their own ideas. And so Paul says, we have an appointment with the Creator. He will judge the world. He will do so by a man whom he has appointed by raising him from the dead. So he comes back to the resurrection. Now this was directly contrary to the script of one of their plays. In one of their famous plays, the god Apollos says this, when a man dies and his blood is spilled on the ground, there is no resurrection. There is no resurrection. Now, I think that's pretty understandable. We, we don't see resurrection. I've conducted a lot of funerals and I've not seen any resurrection. Um, people uh, don't rise again never to die. But the Christian claim is that God, in the person of Jesus, did something unique. It was the first fruit of a whole new world. It's the beginning of something that God had promised in ancient times, as it were, to the Jewish people, that they would become his people, that the earth would come to know him, that, that sorrow and sighing would flee away, that the griefs, grief, griefs that we live with will be done away with, and God will embrace a people who will live in a righteous way, whose lives will please him. Jesus spoke about this. The sum of the law is to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. It, it's that hard. It's that simple. So here the, the Apostle Paul is pushing this out there to the Roman world. Now, he says, right now he has called on all men everywhere to repent. Now it's time to change your mind. That's what the word repent means. Change your way of thinking. Now, the surprise... Uh, of an end time encounter was a shock to the Greeks. He will judge the world by a man he has appointed. So we believe that Jesus has inaugurated a kingdom and his kingdom is coming. His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's our prayer. That's what we work for. That's why we believe that the righteous things that we do, the good deeds that we perform, that, that every day, uh, as Christine's favorite verse reminds us, there are good works that God has prepared for us to do. They're out there to be done. And none of those things will ever be wasted. That's all towards the, uh, the world that God is building and will inaugurate fully at his return, which was the problem that the Thessalonians had, remember, last week? They had this problem about what happens to those we love who have already died. Will they miss the resurrection? And Paul says, no, they will come with Christ to earth. And so here we have this appointment. He's come to the same place that he came last time. They didn't know this. They were ignorant about this. And it was a hard, hard to, to take on board. But there were three responses. Some laughed. What a joke, you know. We've seen a lot of graves. We've been to a lot of battlefields. We, don't, we know dead people don't come back. But yet, as Christine said earlier, they, they were, the evidence for the resurrection, you know, when explored, you've got to say, how did the Christian church come into existence? Why did the, the women's tale, why were the women the first to report this? Why did G, the, the, the angels send them, apostello, to the men so that the men could come and check it out and find out? When the Apostle Paul lists his witnesses, we're told who, th who they were. And he says he was the least of them. And so we have this amazing group of people who are starting to live differently. And, and uh, we're told that they turned the world upside down when they got uh, along this Roman road. They turned the world upside down and now they're here. Well, are they just jokers or are they serious? 
Will they last or will it fade away? Well, some of them dismissed it. Others said, we'll, we'll hear you again about this. It's a lot to take on board. But still others believed. They were persuaded. Maybe they were the, they were the ones who were, had already heard him at the synagogue and it was sympathetic to the idea that there's only one God over all and had already fallen away from the, the many gods of Greece. Um, but two of them are named. Two of them who believed. And their names were... Dionysius and Damaris. It's interesting how uh, in writing his text to us, Luke has uh, a man and a woman. He keeps mentioning uh, people, presumably because he had their names. Uh, perhaps they were staying the course and he met them later, we don't know. But here they were. Dionysius and Damaris changed their minds. And this comes to all of us. Have we received the message? Has, has it changed our mind? Are we changing our minds? Even just seeing the names uh, Dion and Damaris uh, came like a breath of fresh air to me. It reminds me that people do respond and the message today is growing in the world. And it is under immense pressure. Uh, today we will be praying shortly for uh, Turkmenistan, it's our country where it's very hard to be a Christian. It's one of the Afghanistan's neighboring countries. And we'll be remembering the challenge of oppressed minorities in many places uh, as, as we come to prayer. But let us remember this. It comes down to men and women and boys and girls who have welcomed a Savior who loves them and cares about them and wants their lives to mirror something beautiful in the world for God. Now I'm going to invite us to, as we reflect upon these things, to hear from Amanda playing a meditation for us today, Jesus, you joy of man's desiring. This Jesus, you joy of man's desiring is from a chorale by Bach and the translation of the title is um, of the last chorale in this cantata is Herz und Mund und Tod und Leben Heart and Mind and Deed and Life and these, this is the poetry, this, these are the words from that last chorale, uh, yeah, the last chorale in this cantata. Jesus remains my joy, my heart's essence and comfort. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't see with the, I put the wrong glasses. <laughs> I need glasses for reading and glasses for music. And I, I, so, um, I'll start again. So it's a translation from the German. Jesus remains my joy, my heart's essence and comfort. Jesus fends off all suffering. He is my life strength, my eyes desire and sun, S-U-N, my soul's treasure and pleasure. Therefore, I will not leave Jesus out of heart and face. So this is simply the melody line from the cantata. And you'll hear the chorale coming through, like the sun, very simply through this
Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for the introduction as well. It was very special. Now, as we come to our prayers of intercession, I'll try and tie together some of the things that have been going on in our world, both in Melbourne and other places. I might begin with the words that accompany the English translation of the music we've just heard. Jesus, joy of man's desiring, holy wisdom, love most bright. Drawn by thee, our souls aspiring, soar to uncreated light. Creator God, we bow before you this new week to thank you for Jesus and his resurrection that first Easter morning. Truly, you are not far from any one of us, and you yearn that we should know you and find joy and healing in the wholeness of your salvation. We thank you that this message traveled Roman roads 2,000 years ago and has brought hope, healing, education, and transformation to individuals, communities, and even nations. We rejoice that our place in your heart is not earned by our striving, but secured by your beloved Son in whom we trust. Thank you that that trust flows from an understanding of what he has done for us and for our redemption by his life, his death, and resurrection. We live in a world of idols, competing ideas and warring ideologies. Truly, it has been said, the human heart is an idol factory. Please have mercy and forgive us. We thank you that you invite us to have our minds changed and renewed, that we might demonstrate your love and care for our neighbor and your world. Grant that our meditation this morning will contribute to renewed devotion and such loving service. Christine has shared about fact-checking, and we rejoice that your word is truth. You do not ask us to forsake careful thought, but to search the scriptures and reason together, bringing our minds into the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the insights of C.S. Lewis and his continuing legacy among us, and for the work of Christians in the seats of learning, especially for Rosalind Pickard and Ian Hutchinson at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and countless others serving in universities, training and research institutes, medical research facilities. Thank you that at this, this week we have heard of the development of new treatments for the COVID-19 virus. As we begin booster vaccinations for the most vulnerable, we are conscious that many in the poor nations have not been offered any vaccination against COVID yet. We pray that this situation will turn around, that the wisdom of the World Health Organization leaders and the goodwill and goodwill among the nations will express itself in care for the poor. As Australia embarks on its roadmap out of lockdown, guide our political leaders with wise counsel from the health specialists to safely negotiate the path through social isolation, psychological stress, education deficit, and business failure. We pray today for Christians worshiping in difficult conditions, thinking especially of Turkmenistan. Strengthen their hand and grant that liberty might be given post COVID to worship in their own homes. We recall that Christians are the most persecuted minority group in many countries, even as we pray today for the Rohingya, the Karen, the Uyghurs, and others who are oppressed. We remember the frail elderly and sick friends this morning. Bring encouragement and hope to them now as we commit them to you in the quiet of our own hearts. We thank you for these older folk and for those who are not older but yet are vulnerable. We thank you for the fortitude and the courage with which they have faced their situation. And as we lift them to you, we ask that they might cast their care on you, know that you care about them. We ask this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together and say, Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with you and with those whom you love, indeed with each one of us now and always. Amen.